Jack Elliott Jr. is no stranger to Albany. We've had him come and speak. I, I think I lost count, Jack, how many times, but um, it's always good. <laughs> but he probably knows more about the Faulkner family and the history of, than any other one person that I know of. He's really a history detective, and I heard him say earlier that he might be obsessive compulsive. <laughs> so well, maybe he is. My wife said that. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Um, but he generally gets to the bottom of things in his research. And along with being a historian and a writer, he's an archaeologist. He worked with the um, Mississippi Department of Archives and History for many years as um, an archaeologist. And um, then he also taught archaeology, geography, religion at the Meridian campus of Mississippi State University. He's from a little crossroads named Palo Alto that, um, that's his postage stamp of native soil that he loves. So um, he's a speaker and a tour guide for the Yacht and Photographer Conference and lots of other things that I don't know about. He's written a lot of books. And so join me today in welcoming Jack Elliott. Glad to be here. A good bunch of folks here. And uh, Having in the audience a couple people who were the dedicate, dedic two of the dedicatees of my book. Uh, one is Melinda Marsalis from Ripley, and the other is Tommy Covington from Ripley. They both played a major role in uh, this book coming to be. Melinda, in part because she was the uh, organizer of the Faulkner Heritage Festival in Ripley that was held for several years. And when I attended that in November 19, 2010, that developed my interest or, or re inspired my interest in Colonel Faulkner. And then the other one's Tommy Covington, who is. Uh, Probably Ripley and Tippa County's main uh, proponent in terms of local history and culture and everything. I wanted to explain something in here in the acknowledgments about Tommy. Tommy always talked about how he was real proud because he was delivered by Dr. Charlie Murray of Ripley. Dr. Murray was the great uncle of William Faulkner. But I write, write in the acknowledgments, uh, Tommy was born in the heart of rural Tippa County, birthed by Dr. Charlie Murray and the great uncle of William Faulkner, while, as legend has it, a panther screamed outside the farmhouse door. <laughs> Many people may wonder about that illusion, this legend, and I have to admit, I made it up. But it's not totally without influence. This came from a line that was published in Edgar Rice Burroughs' first Tarzan novel, Tarzan of the Apes, which was a, first appeared in the pulp magazine All Story, October 1912. This is a facsimile edition of it. It talks about that when Tarzan was born, his parents father was Lord Greystoke and his mother, they were had been castaways on the coast of Africa. He said that night a little son was born in a tiny cabin beside the primeval forest while a great tiger screamed before the door and the deep notes of the lion's roar sounded from beyond the ridge. Tiger screaming outside the door. And of course that, I transfer that to Panther. But Edgar Rice Burroughs, when he first wrote Tarzan of the Apes, did not realize that there are no tigers in Africa. <laughs> so he had tigers in the, in the first version that appeared in the pulp magazine. But subsequently, when they published the first edition, somebody had tipped him off that there are no tigers. So he changed the tigers to either lions or, uh, or leopards. I think in the... the Actually, book 
pushing me off it. He became a leopard screaming outside the door. But you know, that's where the legend of Tommy Covington's birth with the panther screaming outside the door came from. The third dedicatee was not able to be with us today. She's uh, slaving away in the office because she's got a sorry ass husband to support. And uh, his primary activities these days are hobnobbing with his uh, with, uh, cronies in a country restaurant in Phoebe, Mississippi. Either that or uh, going to book signings. And his wife supports him in all these activities, so she couldn't be here today. But I do put in there that the acknowledgments that um, was the, uh, in the dedication, rather, said my wife Kathy, who throughout the research and writing endured and even occasionally prevailed. Some may catch uh, the allusion here to the last lines of William Faulkner's Nobel Prize acceptance speech where he said that humanity will endure and even prevail. Have you ever noticed that uh, your interests today oftentimes go back to childhood interest, things that inspired a sense of wonder in your life? And later on, you built on those interests and built on them, and after a while, you might even forget how you got interested in them. We could trace a genealogy of my interest in this back to my childhood when I was growing up on extinct, the side of the extinct town of Palo Alto, Mississippi, in western Clay County, where whenever we proud out of the garden up in the spring, you find it's broken pottery and old rusted nails and other things. I wonder how in the world this old stuff get here. My father told me there used to be a little town here and the orig our original home was originally a log house. So as a child, you're gonna see or find a sense of wonder at the things you find around you, coming out of the ground and stuff. That led on to a eventual career in history and archaeology, but to a big degree, local stuff. I was interested in it because you could find tangible remains around me. When I really became in, I really began to do a lot of work in local history and history of Palo Alto was in 1973, when I was about 19, 20. And soon after that, I discovered the works of William Falk. And that really tied in the local history because not so much the literary part, but the fact that there was this tangible county that he created, Yachtka Patolfa County, named from a Chickasaw name. And of course, we lived in the Chickasaw area. The nearby creeks were Polka and Sukatanchi. And um, so I saw a real linkage to my interest in the local history developing around Faulkner's work. Well, the next year, 74, there are advertisements for an upcoming William Faulkner and Yachtka Patolfa conference that's going to be held at Ole Miss. So I was uh, 20, going on 21 at the time, and I signed up for it, went up there, and I went on the tours. And the tours, um, I went on every tour. I was more interested in tours than I was on literary analysis. But one of them took us to uh, New Albany and up to Ripley. Had a fascinating time. Parts of Ripley that I remember most, or actually all that I really remember after <laughs> after 50 years, was I remember the place where Faulkner was supposedly shot, which was Renfro's Cafe on the square in Ripley, turned out later on, not the right place, and Colonel Faulkner's monument. Well, I 
You know, after all of this time, I wind up placing Colonel Faulkner's monuments on the cover of the book, as you can see, with the title to the ramparts of infinity, which is a, a line that came from William Faulkner and I'm a Neanderthal when it comes to anything more complicated than the wheel or the screw or the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to have to ask, well, the Lord have mercy. You got it. <laughs> you know, what said a problem was, is if you have a monkey that's randomly typing, how long would it take you to type out the complete works of William Shakespeare just randomly going on? I always feel like that. If I keep punching something, <laughs> something will turn up. <laughs> Colonel Faulkner was um, the inspiration for William Faulkner's character, Colonel John Sartorus, who was really kind of a leading figure in his whole Yacht of Tulfa series. He was a very in a way that series was really anchored around him, built up around the myth of Colonel John Sartorus, who was equivalent to Colonel William Faulkner. The very first book that William Faulkner published dealing with Yachtapatawpha County was uh, his book Sartorus, which you can see there. And I guess that the portrait is supposed to represent Colonel John Sartorus. And the very first lines of Sartorus deal with Colonel Sartorus, who was by then deceased for several decades, but it talks about his legend that grew up around him. And as it, as it opens, it says, as usual, old man falls. It brought John Sartorus into the room with him, fetching like an odor, like the clean, dusty smell of his faded overalls the spirit of the dead man into that room where the dead man's son sat, and where the two of them, pauper and banker, would sit for half an hour in the company of him who passed beyond death and then returned. So, there's you a know, key linkage between Colonel William Faulkner and Colonel John Sartorus and the whole Dr. Patalfa series. Well, after I'd have been to Ripley the first time in 74, I would occasionally come back in my work as for the Mississippi Department of Archives and History if I was ever in Ripley. I'd, I'd always go out to the cemetery just to see the old the marker of Colonel Sartorus, according to Colonel Faulkner, and what it stood for in terms of the, this interplay between legend of a man and literary transformation and the actual history, all of it blended together. But when I retired in 2010, I was soon, I soon happened to be communicating with um, Melissa McCoy Bell, who was a native of Tupa County, but then she was living uh, outside of Memphis. But she invited, she was, uh, working with Melinda on the Faulkner Conference there in Ripley, and she invited me to come, and I, I hadn't heard about it. I thought, well, what the heck, I'll go up there. And I went up there, and uh, and as my wife says, I tend to be kind of obsessive compulsive. I couldn't just let a visit go by without becoming a major obsession. So I started coming back on a weekly basis to go to Chancery Clerk's office to go through deeds, to look for sites, and go through newspapers and everything. And I'm first trying to just figure out where things happen, I've always been obsessed with the linkage between history and place and memory. As so I was working on that, and I went on that, that and a few other projects for a few years, and then suddenly I realized, hell, I've got so much information. I want to write a biography. I hadn't even considered writing a biography of anybody. Biographies are just sort of remote from my experience. So 
but I thought, well, I've got so much information, I might as well try to write a biography, and I, that's where eventually the book came about. But anyway, it goes back to my childhood, to my interest in place and everything, and how that was transformed through reading Faulkner, Jacques Tolfa, Saga, and then there coming to Ripley and everything. Of course, I met Melinda at the first conference. Tommy wasn't there. Tommy Covington was there at that meeting, but I soon met him, and he's a big help to me over the years, giving me books and everything and my need and helping me in any way possible and helping me out with the scanning of photos and everything. Let me tell you, this thing's got a good many photographs. I think it's about 67, 68. There would have been a lot more. The editors may have cut out about 30 or so. I'm big on pictures. I always tell people that I always try to cater my books to the widest possible audience, both literate and illiterate alike. So if you can't read, if you get one of my books, you should at least have some pictures to look at. And uh, anyway, so I was trying to get a lot of pictures in it, but as I say, I technology above the basic um, basic mechanical inventions of the wheel, the lever, the pulley and all of that. Anything beyond that is pretty much outside of my realm. But Tommy helped me with pictures. He was he collected so many pictures over the ages and he provided me with great scans of them and everything and Anything I needed scanning, he could do it and everything. And Tommy, it's just a jack of all trades. Here's a picture of the Ripley graveyard with the <coughs> statue of Colonel Faulkner in the, in the center. Superimposed on it is text from Sartorus. You see the current statue of Colonel Faulkner there, and in the foreground is where the railroad runs. It still runs the one that ran from uh, Middleton, Tennessee, down to Ripley and New Albany and Pontotoc, and eventually on beyond that to Mobile, eventually. But William Faulkner in the book Sartorus described the statue, the statue of for him is Colonel John Sartorus, but it's almost identical to that of Colonel Faulkner. It says the statue stood on a stone pedestal, his back to the world and his carbon eyes gazing out across the valley where his railroad ran, and the blue changeless hills beyond, and beyond that, the ramparts of infinity itself. That's where the title comes from statue gazing out across the valley where the railroad ran to the hills beyond that and beyond that to the ramparts of infinity itself. Now this uh, I'll evoke an image of boundless vision which really is pretty evocative of Colonel Faulkner. He was in many ways kind of a square peg in a round hole. He didn't do things like everybody else did them in terms of building the railroad. Most people, they had tried for years to build a railroad to Ripley, but they couldn't do it, couldn't get up the money. Ripley wasn't about 500 people. You don't want to build a railroad 25 miles from Middleton down to Ripley. It took a lot of capital. Most places that built railroads were based in big cities where you had a lot of capital and to invest. But if you talk about running it from Middleton, which is smaller than Ripley, down to Ripley, you're talking about quite an achievement in terms of getting together money. Well, Colonel Faulkner did it. He, his methods were often unorthodox in terms of how he could get money and he get reimbursed, he could get people out there to work for him. And he would oftentimes be a little uh, uh, somewhat romantic, romanticized in his talking about it. He talked, for example, about uh, an 
all the people out there working, the politicians were working and everything, and he said, and, and even widows were giving up the last smoked ham from their smokehouse to feed the workers, such as that. But he could get it done. And what's really amazing is that you don't think about how really almost crazy this sounds. Before he really got the railroad built, he was talking about turning it into a transcontinental railroad. <laughs> Which I'm sure the, this eventually caused him a conflict between himself and former partner in the railroad, R.J. Thurman, a lot of conflict. Thurman didn't have that kind of vision. He was kind of a very tight-fisted individual looking at the bottom line and thought we go to crazy steps that, you know, would seem to possibly bring about just financial ruin. But in the end, he built the railroad on down, he got it to Pontotoc, and eventually after his death, it was turned into a railroad that ran from Mobile all the way up through here, New Albany, Pontotoc, and eventually Jackson, Tennessee, and then on up to Chicago through other linkages. So he was a wild visionary. It's, it's kind of funny, you know, the idea of building a railroad to Ripley, that's oftentimes mentioned. Well, he was the one that thought of the idea of building a railroad to Ripley. And then another person came back and said, no, it wasn't him because they were trying to do it before him. And the way I point out in the book is that the idea of building a rail, railroad to Ripley from Middleton, Tennessee, was nothing. Everybody that knew what a damn railroad was dreamed of building a railroad to Ripley because they wanted to get out of the mud, have something that take them through, going from Ripley on to Memphis and points beyond. But the idea was so commonplace thing is, is not so much who could have the ideas. Ideas for building railroads are dime a dozen. The thing that counted was who could get it done. And Colonel Faulkner eventually got it done. Here are a couple portraits. They're the only two known portraits of Faulkner, both of them from the 1880s. It's kind of strange that he was such, he was in the media so often in the press and everything and in writing books, building railroads, even had, wrote a play that was presented at two different occasions in the 1860s and 1880s in Ripley. He's always kind of in the limelight and people loved it. But he's a very personable guy, as you can see. One of the things that was a real eye-opener to me was reading his book, Rapid Ramblings in Europe, which is a travelogue of his times in Europe. Now, a lot of people, including his great-grandson, William Faulkner, talked about how grim individual he was and how almost you know, violent-prone and everything. The writer Joel Williamson, in his book, William Faulkner and Southern History, he wrote about him, about the trial of Thurman, and then how people were almost relieved when Thurman was let off because he'd done everybody a favor by killing Faulkner. That's crazy. Read the rapid, rapid ramblings in Europe, or read other things that are not as prominent. But he was not a grim individual. He was a guy who had self-deprecating humor. He was always laughing. And he could win local elections. In 1889, he ran for position of representative in the state legislature. He ran against the incumbent. And another man who had already been the legislator. So these are two known names that are real well known and two others, so four people he was running against. He beat them all in the first election. He borrowed in a majority. In a local election where people know you, people don't vote for you if they don't like you. 
and he two an incumbent and one other guy who basically a former incumbent and uh, says something about his personality. But read Rapid Ramblings in Europe that tells different events and everything, and you see him as a very sensitive individual to others and how he would joke with them whenever he talked about his past career. His career during the Civil War, he was in a self-deprecatory humor, talking about how many Yankees he killed because they were they wore themselves out chasing him, <laughs> kind of alluding to the fact that he's fleeing from them, and they just uh, wore themselves out chasing him and everything. That's not a guy that's vainglorious, by any means. But these two photographs, they're both in the book, and they're the only ones that I knew of at the time of him. One other subsequently appeared, as you'll see, a bit later. All of you know are familiar with the Tanglefoot Trail, which uh, the northern terminus is in uh, New Albany and goes down to Houston, which is a wonderful thing. I've covered every inch of the Tanglefoot Trail more than once. I love it, but you know the Tanglefoot Trail, the Tanglefoot name comes from this locomotive that ran on the Ripley Railroad. But the real name, Tanglefoot, was a nickname for this locomotive. Its formal name was the Colonel W.C. Faulkner. So the name Tanglefoot has multiple allusions to different things. It alludes to the locomotive, but it also kind of alludes to Colonel Faulkner whose locomotive was named after, and also who, who was the one who built the railroad. At least it was built as far as Pontotoc during his lifetime. This was a, the railroad was a narrow gauge railroad, which is only three foot width between the rails. You know, a railroad today is a standard gauge four feet eight and a half inches from rail to rail. And this is about three feet. So it made a pretty small railroad. And all of that was done to as a cost cutter. Actually that's why Faulkner went with having a narrow gauge railroad was cut the cost to get the railroad down to Ripley and everything. And later on standard gauge it and of course, the railroad that's still in existence from New Albany up to Ripley, it's all standard gauge today. This um, quote from Maud Morrow Brown of, of uh, Oxford, she was a native of Oxford, I believe. She was married to Calvin Brown, who was professor of, I believe, literature, but he wrote the first book on archaeology of Mississippi that came out in 1925. So she, Maud knew the Faulkners, and she was friends with Maud Butler Faulkner, who was a mother of William Faulkner. She wrote and published an article in the 1950s on Colonel Faulkner, where she says that even while he lived, Colonel Faulkner was a subject of amazing and contradictory stories. After his death, these stories multiplied into such fantastic and exaggerated legends that today it is often impossible to divide the truth from the false. I found this to be very true. <laughs> when I was researching this, I was found all kinds of stories about him that absolutely were not true. Just uh, a couple weeks ago, I was, um, had lunch with some of his descendants in Oxford, and one of them started telling me about a story about uh, his conflict with R.J. Thurman, and if they were, you know, they were running against each other for the legislature, not true. <laughs> R.J. Thurman did not run for the legislature. Anyway, these stories floated around, and so I, it's kind of like in writing this book is not only bringing in new information, but it's also having to separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of the stories that are floating around. 
one of them concerned where Colonel Faulkner was shot on the, about 5.30, November 5th, 1889, on Square in Ripley. This is Renfro's Cafe, burned 2012, but many of you will remember it there. It was a very popular eating place for decades. This was told when I arrived in Ripley in 1974. This is where Colonel Faulkner was killed. I mean, where he was shot. He didn't actually die until the next, more than 24 hours later. But anyway, this is where he was supposedly shot. And the reason that this was believed to be where he was shot was because the buildings formerly stood on the site there was this frame office building that was known as the Thurman office. And it was a Thurman office. As we found out, it wasn't R.J. Thurman's office. R.J. was the one who shot Faulkner. It was R.J.'s son, Charlie Miller Thurman. He, Charlie Miller Thurman was, an, was a lawyer, and his office was right there. But it turns out his father's office was where the shot shooting took place. It was a half a block to the south of there. At this site, which was up until within the last year or so, was the site of the uh, Mississippi Gold and Silver Exchange. Something else, I believe the guy that ran this Gold and Silver Exchange was murdered, wasn't he? But anyway, this is where the shooting took place. And then they took him, put him on a mattress and, or a bed spring and carried him a couple blocks away to his daughter's house. And he died there the next night about 10 o'clock. Here's the old uh, depot at Ecru. This was built on the, was on the railroad that he, he built it if you continued it on south from uh, Ripley down to New Albany and then Ecru and Pontotoc, this is the depot there. One of the stories there was that he named the depot and might be some truth in that, but where the truth lies, I don't really know because the story involves him in settling a dispute between two families who wanted the depot named after themselves. And he was trying to settle a dispute and they weren't going along with it. One won't name it, we name it after us because so and so and other won't name it after them. And he finally said, well, hell, just name it Ecru. That's the color of the depot. Ecru is a, is a color that's kind of close to tan or something like that with a little green tint in it, I believe. I never really realized that, what Ecru was until I looked it up. But anyway, that was a tale that Colonel Faulkner solved the dispute. One of the main stories associated with Colonel Faulkner was the shooting of Robert Holt Heinemann. These are the Heinemann brothers taken, this is before 1849, so this is a very early image. The one on the left is um, Thomas Carmichael Heinemann Jr., who was a younger brother, and the one sitting with a cigar in his mouth, Robert Holt Heinemann. I've got below the Heinemann brothers I put not to be trifled with because apparently they were real badasses. I mean, you didn't mess with them. In the account, uh, account of a journal is written on the, of a doctor from Columbus who was with the company being sent to Mexico that Faulkner was with, and this is in 1846, 47. They're going down there and it talks about an incident. They were had problems with the food and it says that Tom Heinemann, the one on the left, got mad about the food and smashed a plate over a steward's head. I guess a steward or basically the waiter. And you know, and oh, well, these these were not nice people. <laughs> Get mad over and smash a plate over somebody's head. I bet that hurt. 
But Robert Holt Heinlein was one of the ones uh, who was killed by Faulkner in 49. As the story goes, Faulkner was a member of a temperance society. Of course, temperance was societies were trying to fight against drinking. Well, Robert Heinemann was trying to get into the temperance society, as odd as that may sound, you would think that hell he's, he'd be anything but for temperance. But anyway, he wanted in and somebody blackballed him and somebody told him that Faulkner had blackballed him. So he couldn't get into the temperance society. So he just, he's going to go and kill Faulkner. Temperance has come to mean not drinking, but actually, though classical meaning is temperance is to show a sense of restraint. So I don't think getting mad because you black got blackballed and going to shoot somebody because that would be very temperance temperate behavior. But anyway, he came in and pulled out a pistol to shoot fault. And this is the day before metal cartridges. You had. Uh, uh, just had an individual with, uh, fill each chamber with a, with a ball and powder and everything, and then you have a percussion cap on there for each, each thing. And so was, to load a six or seven shot revolver would be a lot of time, but they weren't nearly as dependable as a metal cartridge bullets that we use today. So. Bob Heinemann came in with a pistol and mad at fault and said, I'm going to shoot you, you son of a bitch, and pulled the gun up and fired it, and it didn't fire. And he got mad, he cocked it back again, and he's going to shoot again. Hammer came down, and it didn't fire. So he decided he was going to do it a third time, but by that time, Faulkner stuck a knife into him and killed him. William Faulkner later on talked about how violent his great-grandfather was, but the way I see it, it was self-defense, purely. And he was eventually exonerated for this. But <laughs> I talk about these people were not to be tribal with. Heck, you know, you blackball him from the temperate society, he's going to come over here and try and shoot you. <coughs> and I couldn't be too hard on Colonel Faulkner about that. Anyway, here's the uh, headstone for Robert Holt Heinemann. This is on Highway 4, just a couple miles or so east of Ripley. And it says, it gives the dates and everything about it. Robert Holt, eldest son of Thomas C. and Sarah Heinemann, born June 20, 1822, killed at Ripley, Mississippi by William C. Faulkner. Killed at Ripley, Mississippi by William C. Faulkner. And one of the stories that Crick came about, about Faulkner, was it said that the Heinemans originally had it carved into the stone and it said murdered by William C. Faulkner, but there was such a hue and cry against it that they chiseled that out and put chains murdered into killed. As you can see though, the stone is in good condition and has never been altered. Besides, though in the Heinemans, I don't believe they would have been suddenly shocked if they put down murder and just said, oh, we've gone too far. We've got to change the wording. You know, we've got to be politically correct. You know. And there we go, you can see it better. Kill or Ripley, Mississippi. For decades, one of the real landmarks at Ripley was the old uh, Colonel Faulkner House. This was built in 1884, or rather, it was actually an older house that was modified in 1884. And the story got started was that. Uh, we, Colonel Faulkner, when he's in his European trip, had seen a house that he liked, and he, and he built it in Ripley. 
I can't find a single bit of evidence that this is true. Certainly he had this built a year after European travel, but there's no real, real reason to believe the European influence because you'll see Carl Faulkner, no, that's not Carl Faulkner, I wrote it. It's, uh, you see, notice the high gables there on this uh, portico. This is a uh, example of Gothic revival architecture. This is an American example. And then the eaves and everything or and uh, a lot of the other stuff is Italianate. Both of these styles were very much in fashion in the United States in the 1880s. There's no reason to believe he copied a European house. He was just architect he got, used a Gothic revival and Italianate styles and incorporated into the new house. But interesting, one thing I did find nobody ever picked up on was the name of his house, which was called Warwick Place. He did visit Warwick Castle in England, and so it's almost certainly the place where he got the name for his house from. This is an image from um, his book, Rapid Ramblings in Europe published in 1884 following his 1883 trip to Europe. This is, I put this in here for a couple reasons. One of them being they show his sense of humor. He said the story about being down in burial catacombs under a, 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 a monastery in Rome where they had all these bodies laid out and everything and he said he was standing there and a little girl came up and started pulling on his finger and then when he drew it back she said oh mama that mummy is alive I saw its head move and throughout the book he, was allude, he would allude to himself as being like the, the mummy came into the room and something and an arrogant person does not get into self-deprecating humor. And I, I thought, well, this guy had a good sense of humor. I, I think I would have liked him. Now, right after the book came out, I got an email from Jim Price. Who lives, I'm not sure where he lives now, but he is the grandson of Judge John Faulkner and the great-great-grandson of Colonel Faulkner. And uh, Jim, anyway, had an attachment. And he said, I hate to take up your time, but I've got a copy of a, I have an old photograph that was in my copy of Rapid Rambling in Europe. And I was wondering if this would be of interest to you. <laughs> and this was a third known photograph of Colonel Faulkner. I didn't even know a third one existed. I wish I'd had it before, I could have brought that out. But it was this one. And as you'll see, it was the same thing as used as illustration in the book. The one in the book was a lithograph, which is etched onto a plate by an artist, but is obviously based on this photograph. You can compare the two side by side here. This is taken in an artist studio in New York City on the left and then presented to an artist who uh, kind of put some masonry in for him to be leaning against to uh, depict the, pic, the uh, burial crypt that he was standing in. But that was a fascinating discovery. And in his monument, this was erected after his death. One of the stories that was always told was that while Colonel Faulkner was in Europe, he had contracted with them to produce a statue of himself to go in Ripley. 
Well, that sounds pretty arrogant. And one of the stories even involved that said they would they wanted to put it on the courthouse square, but the government wouldn't let them. This is of course what was eventually put up, but as my research revealed, that story about him contracting them have it done while he's in Europe is nonsense. It was not contracted until after his death, his family contracted it, and I find no evidence that it was indeed intended to be put up anywhere other than in the cemetery right next to his grave. He's buried in the, uh, the center half of the vault that's on the far left. The one in the middle vault in the middle is his son Henry is buried there. It's a quote now, Colonel Faulkner was murdered in November 1889. More than half a year later we find an art, a little item in the Southern Sentinel of Ripley. It says, we learn that a life-size statue of the late Colonel W.C. Faulkner is now being executed in Italy that has cost $5,000. Over the years, I've seen all kinds of citations for how tall the monument is. But I found no evidence that anyone had actually tried to measure it. There were discrepancies on that. And so I went out there with Tommy. It's, well, both of those are Tommy's uh, ladders out there. And uh, got up there and pretty well measured it. I'll tell you, when I was way up there at the top, I said, Tommy, I'm feeling, it was kind of shaky up here and everything. And you look down. And if you fail, you're liable to land on a, on a iron fence where you could impale or knock your head on a headstone or something. And Tommy said, oh, don't worry, Jack. It's, it looks stable to me. And I said, well, that's easy from your perspective. That's easy for you to say. I noticed Tommy never did get up on the ladder. <laughs> But anyway, that's me, me up there measuring the thing. It turns out from the brick foundation that the, the monument, monument is basically a granite pedestal and then a marble statue on top. The marble and the granite parts all together is 19 feet high. Here's Colonel's statue, kind of a close up with our measuring stick put up there as part of the whole measuring operation. I never did really get any further than about there. I read some account of somebody that claimed they got up there and put a beer can in his hand. When I was up there, I would not get on the base because there's no way, place to stand that. You're just gonna be suspended there. And I don't believe anybody would have gotten over on that thing and put a beer can up there. But we had to eventually calculate it all the way to the top by using this measuring stick to calculate it on so we gone where I was willing to go. I tried to get Tommy to get up there and put a beer can in there, but he wouldn't do that. <laughs> I didn't have a beer can. <laughs> okay. This is... Uh, Conclusion, or at least the last slide. Uh, again, I'll repeat that quote from the book Sartorius. The blue, Colonel Faulkner is looking out beyond the railroad to the blue, changeless hills beyond, beyond that, the ramparts of infinity itself. And that just seemed to summarize his vision for things. Instead of just seeing a railroad just going from Middleton down to Ripley, he saw it as a transcontinental railroad. And I don't think William Faulkner ever really realized how really powerful that vision was to go against people. I don't think anybody else would really willing to go along with, you know, 
he come in and say, well, why don't we turn it into a transcontinental railroad? People say, well, yeah, that's a good idea. You really, you willing to invest in it though? It had problems there. Eventually got it further down when he linked up with the Gulf of Ship Island Railroad, which was starting up and, and it's really led to his death. Because the Gulf of Ship Island Railroad venture with which they were starting down there to the Gulfport. That's what created the city of Port of Gulfport was uh, Gulf and Ship Island Railroad. They were starting down there and that was looked upon as being kind of a risky venture. But Colonel Faulkner got in on to it and um, William Harris Hardy of Meridian, who was the one who built it, his wife named Hattie and Hattiesburg is named after his wife. But anyway, it was kind of a risky venture and Faulkner got in on it and he became vice president of the Gulf and Ship Island Railroad and that's what carried it on down from Ripley to New Albany and Pontotoc. But then the whole thing went bottomed up. Before Faulkner invested in the Gulf of Ship Island Railroad, he was trying to get the whole railroad to come over and R.J. Thurman wouldn't do it. He thought it was too risky, so he bailed out on the project. He must have thought that he just he didn't want to lose everything, which is probably common sensical fault to know what's going on with it. When the project went down in 1888, through a lot of different things that went wrong, <laughs> involving problems with using convicts and everything, and, and and some of the main leaders of the railroad were involved in assassinations and such as that and the project flipped over. When that happened, Colonel Faulkner, who wound up amassing a good bit of capital, he bought the park that had been built from Ripley down to Pontotoc and he put it into his railroad and so where's the whole projects? Went south, Colonel Faulkner floated to the top, smelling like roses. His project survived. And so I know this must have infuriated R.J. Thurman, because he'd been predicting it's gonna go, it's gonna fail. Well, in a way it failed, but Colonel Faulkner emerged a victor from it. And that must have really infuriated Thurman. And then the election in 1889, where Colonel Faulkner came out triumphant, the first primary came out with a majority over four contenders. And that must have really infuriated him. Now, Faulkner is always joking with people. Usually, oftentimes, self deprecatory, self deprecatory, but apparently, Thurman seems to get kind of dicey. They didn't get along too well, and Faulkner apparently used sarcasm, you know. and. So Thurman was stewing because his predictions had all been wrong. Faulkner emerged the victor against all odds. And so, of course, Faulkner would have to gloat a little bit, kind of pick at him, you know. Well, you don't always pick at a guy with a bad temper. So on the evening of November 5th, 1889, as the votes were coming in, I don't know if the polls had closed yet or not, but Faulkner was out there wandering around the square in Ripley. He was really on a roll. I mean, he was loved by everybody, practically. And then he saw old Thurman working late in his office, and he went up to the door and said something. People always wonder what he said. He probably said something kind of sarcastic, you know, about you having a good time, Dick? <laughs> or something like that. And Thurman just went berserk and pulled out a pistol and shot him in the mouth. And he died over 24 hours later. When they finally brought Thurman to trial, he was eventually acquitted on 
charge of healers. Claim self-defense. Well, if you look at all the way these cases were handled, all you had to prove back then was that you had some sort of fear that he might have had a gun and was going to shoot you. Faulkner did not have a gun. He was, so he was not planning on shooting. Why would he be mad at him? He was going to taunt him. He's not mad at him. Thurman was the one that's mad. But I'm sure he said that, you know, well, I thought he had a gun. And I thought he could have had a gun. He was going for it. And I shot him in self-defense. And that's probably what happened. They claim self-defense like that and without really any grounds for it. If you read my book, you'll see a lot of cases of these conflicts. One person gets killed, the survivor claims self-defense, self-defense. Of course, the self-defense claim would be pretty weak today. But that's basically how he came to an end and he became a legend. Pretty quickly, he's already very well known, having just won an election, and he's, he's known for having written and published books, having built the railroad. Immediately after his death, people wrote some poems about his death, about him, and they were these were cast as though. Um, For example, here's one that appeared in a newspaper, and it um, it sound, sounds a whole lot like uh, P.B. Shelley's Adonis, uh, Elegy on the Death of John Keats, and I'll read you a few lines. Oh, can it be that he is dead, the brave, the gentle, true and kind, whom all the people loved and who to everybody was a friend? Can it be true that he will come no more among us as of yore? Can it be true that he is dead, that our beloved Faulkner is no more? Alas, too true the message came, too true the word that told his doom, and all the people whom he loved are sad and their faces veil in gloom. Well, anyway, that was one. There were several like that in there. Don't see poetry like that very often. It's not very good, I guess. But uh, anyway, it does express the sense of romant, romanticizing his death and such. Okay, do we have any questions? How old was he when he died? He was 64. After Thurman was acquitted, did he live briefly? Did he leave? Did he leave briefly after he was acquitted? Oh, no. Perfect. He did gradually, but it's a couple decades, a decade or so later. So many of these stories about concerning Faulkner or that are wrong, which one involves that one says that right after Faulkner shot, I mean, Thurman shot Faulkner, he left and went somewhere else. Not true. He stayed on for years and eventually. He had a couple daughters that married husband from Chatham, North Carolina, and fought, I mean, Thurman and his wife would start going there in the summers because it was a little cooler, and then uh, eventually, about 1907 or something like that, he said that R.J. Thurman had moved to Chatham, North Carolina permanently, and then he died a few months later. But, and he's buried there in North Carolina, but it, it was a the move took place over years. So it's not like he was left out of fear. Any others? Yes. Well, well, first, thank you for this fascinating talk. Uh, and I certainly don't know much about Colonel Faulkner, but is this book some sort of a biography of Colonel Faulkner? Or is it? Oh, it's a biography. It is. Okay. Yeah. Yes, didn't, he, uh, didn't he own newspapers at one time? Or ran newspapers? He was part owner of the New Albany Echo there for a while, and his nephew, whose name was also William C. Falk, and I believe was the editor or something, while here in New Albany. I tried to piece together for 
history of that paper and other papers in New Albany. I believe there's no surviving New Albany newspaper from 18, late 1880s, but I tried to pull together as much as I could. Are there any others? What happened to the railroad after he died? Well, eventually, in 1902, his family sold it to a bigger railroad in 1902, and they, they were the ones that started building it south from Pontotoc on down to Mobile. And that was completed, I believe, in 1905 or 1906. And at that time, when they started building the park from New Albany south, that was all changed to standard gauge at the time, and north of New Albany was converted to standard gauge about a year or two later. Any others? How did he become a colonel in the Well, that's a long story. Uh, complicated story. <laughs> he was, seemed to be very well liked. And of course, officer positions were usually elective at the time. He became, when the battle, I mean, the War of Mexico broke out in 1846, they formed a company in Ripley and they elected officers. And Falker, who was only 20 at the time, was elected first lieutenant. So before he had served a day in any kind of a military thing, he became a lieutenant. In the 1850s, well, he was an attorney afterwards, you know, and among other things, in the late 1850s, he ran for the position of uh, Brigadier General of the State Militia, which is basically a National Guard, and he was elected. So he became Brigadier General. In 1850s, he was a general before he was actually a colonel. Then when the Civil War broke out and he was at the head of a company, he was elected captain. But then as the companies consolidated in the regiments, he was elected colonel. And so that's kind of a nutshell how he did it. But he was a general before he was ever colonel. Anybody else? is it's kind of hard to document and I know there were a couple different routes that been surveyed going south from Ripley with one probably going through Orizaba which is I guess would have been east of uh, what's now cotton plant but um, they're always needing money and everything and I'm sure that General Lowry probably got some investors together to put up money to make it go through Blue Mountain. It makes sense to, you know, we already have a little town and a college there to take it through there. Anybody else? Didn't uh, New Albany do the same thing? Find investors for the railroad? Yeah, they helped out. As a matter of fact, they were having trouble getting together the investors at one point as they were building the railroad south from Cotton Plant. And they couldn't come up with the money that Colonel Faulkner needed. And so he told he stopped construction and moved all the workers down to Pontotoc where the rail route was established. And he made a threat to New Albany. He said, if y'all don't come up with the money, I'm going to have to take it in an alternate route and bypass New Albany by three miles. Well, New Albany came up with the money. 